It was Monday, June the 10th, 2019, when five teenagers found themselves stuck in a storm drain. See, recent storms in Maslin, Ohio, resulted in an overflowing creek, which, of course, attracted the attention of six adventurous teenagers. And as they went to go investigate the the rising creek, it wasn't long before one of them lost their footing, and as a result, he was swept down into the storm drains. The remaining boys, they tried to form a human chain in order to rescue their friend, Um, But alas, it was unfortunate that they too were also swept away by the strong storm waters. And as a result, all of them struggled to survive as they waited for someone to save them from the floodwaters. Well, thankfully for them, rescuers showed up and saved them from the waters that had swept them away. And after the teenagers were pulled to safety, there was one officer who was on the scene. He told reporters this. He said they were visibly distraught because it was near death for them. Lieutenant Michael Mayer also added this. He says, I think they understand the reality of how bad it really could have been. This was something that they didn't understand before. Before they were swept into that storm drain, they didn't get how dangerous this was. And what this means then is that the teenagers who were saved from the storm drains there in Ohio, they ended up emerging from those waters a little bit wiser than they were before they fell in. They ended up becoming a little more cautious than they were before the ordeal. And in this way, we can see how this storm actually helped these teenagers to become a little smarter at the end of the day. It's in a similar yet spiritual way that the believer who finds themselves swept away by the storms of life, we too can emerge from the storm a little bit wiser than we were before. And we can be a little bit more mature and and maybe a little bit more cautious in our walk with the Lord. But not only that, we can also become those Christians who are able to rejoice in knowing that the Lord Jesus has a purpose in the storms that he allows He has a purpose and and he has a plan in allowing us to go through the storm. And as we study uh, the Bible story that's before us this morning, we're going to begin to see, first of all, that the Lord Jesus leads us to the storm. Not only that, but we're also going to see that the Lord Jesus also guides us through the storm. Thirdly and finally this morning, we'll see that the Lord Jesus saves us from the storm. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Here we find the Lord Jesus. He's directing his disciples down to the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And as you make your way to the fourth chapter of Mark, I want to take a moment to consider those who spend their time chasing storms. You might not know this, but there are such people. They're called storm chasers. Storm chasers are those who closely monitor severe weather conditions, all with the goal of going and witnessing the storm in person. And while some storm chasers are meteorologists who are attempting to gather scientific data about severe storms, there are also those who are nothing more than adrenaline junkies. There are adrenaline junkies who chase storms for the sheer adventure of the chase. And while most people actually do their best to flee from the path of the severe storm, the storm chaser is the one who charts a course which leads them straight to the storm. That's what they want. They want a course that takes them directly into the storm. And it's in similar fashion here in Mark chapter 4 where we find the Lord charting a course towards the storm. He's actually directing his disciples into the storm. And while many of us might find it hard to believe that the Lord would lead his disciples into the center of a storm, the fact of the matter is that the Lord was the one who directed his disciples to board the boats all the while knowing that they were about to find themselves in the middle of a strong storm. Now, with this as our focus, let's consider Mark's account of this story, which is found here in Mark chapter 4. If you would look with me there, we'll begin reading at verse 35. Here Mark writes, On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, 
so that it was already filling. Now, here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus, he's actually directing his disciples to board a boat. He directed them to board a boat so that they could set sail and cross over the Sea of Galilee to the other side. Now, I've personally been on the Sea of Galilee twice, and, and both times I was happy that the waters were calm. At the same time, I know enough about the Sea of Galilee to realize that in, in both of those cases, violent storms could have risen up. You know, that it's not uncommon for storms to just come out of nowhere there on the Sea of Galilee. And while it's difficult to determine when these sudden storms might occur, I, I'm here to tell you the disciples couldn't have known that they were about to find themselves in the middle of that severe storm. They couldn't have just looked you know, at the sky and said, oh, the, there's a storm coming. No, uh, storms on the Sea of Galilee can, can, can pop up within moments. And so the disciples, they didn't know that they were heading into a storm when they boarded that boat. But you know who did know? Jesus. Jesus knew. Remember, the Lord Jesus is God incarnate. And therefore, it's easy for us to believe that he knew what was about to happen. He knew that they were headed straight into the center of a severe storm. Therefore, when the Lord Jesus directed his disciples to board that boat, he was the one who was actually leading them to the storm. He was actively leading his followers into a life-threatening situation. Is that difficult to believe? That the Lord Jesus would lead his disciples into a life-threatening situation? Matthew confirms this. He tells us that the disciples of Christ followed the Lord Jesus into the boat. It's actually in the eighth chapter of his gospel account where Matthew tells us that when he, that is Jesus, got into a boat, his disciples followed him. It wasn't the disciples saying, hey, Jesus, let's go, you know, let's go get in a boat and go out on the sea. No, it wasn't the disciples. It was Jesus. Jesus got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Jesus boarded the boat first, followed by those who were following him by faith. And with that being the case, I can't help but to wonder, how many of them would have followed the Lord Jesus had they known that he was actually leading them into a storm? Had Jesus said, uh, you know what, uh, I want you to get into this boat. We're going to go out here and, 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 and our lives are going to be at risk. The boat's about to sink. You know, this is about, this is, you know, we're about to have some troubled times. How many of those disciples would have been like, yeah, no, no thanks. I'll stand here and stay on the shores where it's safe. Luke confirms the fact that they were following Jesus into this storm. It's in Luke chapter 8 where we learn that it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. Now, when Luke tells us that the disciples were in jeopardy, this is not to say that they were hanging out with Alex Trebek. You know, we're not talking about that kind of jeopardy. We typically associate the word jeopardy with a game show that requires contestants to present their answers in the form of a question. But that's not what we're talking about here. The Greek word which here is rendered jeopardy was used of any dangerous situation in which people find themselves in peril. And as we consider the storm that threatened to sink this ship, it's important for us to remember that the Lord Jesus was the one who led them to this moment of jeopardy. Now again, it might be difficult for us to believe, but there ought to be no doubt in our minds that there are times when the Lord Jesus leads his disciples into jeopardy. There are times when he leads us into the center of a severe storm. In order to further explain my point, we should consider the many storms that Paul himself experienced as he set out to serve the Lord. And with this as the focus, hold your place here in the Gospel of Mark, and let's consider something that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's make our way to 2 Corinthians 11, because it's in the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians where we find Paul He's presenting us with a list of the storms that he himself had suffered as he set out to serve the Lord. And as we consider this list of difficulties, it's so important for us to remember that Paul wasn't just going and doing whatever he wanted to do. 
No, he was being led by the Lord. The Lord was the one who led Paul into all of these situations in which he suffered. But this has the focus. If you would look with me there at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I want to draw your attention beginning there at verse 24. Here Paul declares, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things which comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches." Here in these verses, we find Paul, he's describing all of the jeopardy that he had experienced during the days of his missionary journeys. Seems like every time he turned around, he found himself yet in another storm. And as we consider the constant peril that Paul found himself suffering, it's important to remember that the Lord was the one who was leading him into these stormy situations. He was following the leading of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord was leading him into these storms. And with that being the case, it would be incorrect for us to think that those who follow the leading of the Lord will always end up in a safe space where we're all, you know, warm and cuddly and wrapped in a blanket of security and and nothing will ever go wrong. It's incorrect thinking. And yet there's so many Christians who think this way that, well, if the Lord really loves me, then I'm always going to be safe and sound and secure. Not true. Those who follow the leading of the Lord will oftentimes end up in the middle of a storm. The Lord Jesus confirmed this in Matthew chapter 10. It's beginning there at verse 16 where he declares, Behold, I send you out as sheep. Where? In the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Notice with me here that it's our Savior Jesus who sends his sheep into the midst of a wolf pack. He didn't say, I send you out as sheep into a group of other sheep and it's all going to be real nice and sheepy. No, he sends us into the midst of the wolves. And what this means is that the Lord is actively leading us into the storms of life as he calls every Christian to even risk relational rejection that occurs when unbelievers begin to react to our evangelistic endeavors. It's inevitable, Christian, that when we go out to share our faith, that the wolves around us are going to begin to snap and bite. And there are some who attempt to avoid these relational storms by just remaining on the shores of silence. And, you know, if we just don't say anything about our faith and if we just don't challenge any unbeliever about their lifestyle, you know, then, then we can just remain safe from the wolves. We can try to fly under the radar. And yet the Lord doesn't call us to remain on the shores of silence where it's safe. He leads us to the storm. And so I encourage every believer, let's board the boat of obedience knowing that we're headed into the storm this in mind, it's important for us to remember what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3. It's verse 17 where he declares, it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. It is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. It's better for the believer to follow the leading of the Lord, even if his path result in our suffering. Please trust me when I tell you that it's better to suffer the storms of life according to the leading of the Lord than it is for us to obey the Lord or to disobey the Lord, I should say, so that we can stay safe in our shelter. 
With that being the case, I encourage every believer to board the boat of obedience by faith in Jesus Christ. And as we do, let's trust that the one who leads us to the storm is also able to guide us through the storm. Now, this brings us to our second point, because listen, the Lord Jesus is not only the one leading us to the storm, but he's also right there to guide us through the storm. And in order to prove this second point, let's turn our attention back to Mark's account of this stormy situation. Let's pick up our study of Mark chapter four. Look with me again there at verse 37. Here Mark tells us that a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And here in these verses, we find our savior, he's sleeping through the storm. I don't know about you, but I'm not what you would call a light sleeper. Now to look at me, you would think he's a pretty heavy sleeper, but I'm not. Neurologically speaking, I'm a light sleeper who's easily roused from my REM. Now, this is not to suggest that I'm a woke individual, uh, but it's true that I am easily woken from my sleep. With that being the case, it's difficult for me to understand how the Lord Jesus, how he was able to sleep in the midst of the storm. I know that when I take a flight, you know, it's just, it's hard for me to fall asleep. I want to know what's happening around me, you know, and, and yet here's Jesus in the middle of a boat, in the middle of a sea, in the middle of a storm, and just fast asleep. It wasn't difficult for him to fall asleep on that boat, but I'm guessing it was difficult for those who were there in the midst of that storm, wondering if they were about to die. With this in mind, let's take another look there at verse 38. Here we learn that, it, that the Lord Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Here in this verse, we find these disciples, they're jumping to the conclusion that Christ Jesus didn't care about them. They're arriving at this uh, idea that, well, Jesus, you know, being asleep there in the stern of the boat must not care about us, must not care that we're dying. There they were in the midst of the storm. And rather than helping them bail water from the boat, the Lord Jesus was simply sleeping as if he wasn't even worried about the suffering of his servants. And as we consider the concerns of those who are on that sinking ship, I have no doubt that we've all shared the same concerns whenever we find ourselves suffering the storms of life. Now, it's possible that you find yourself today in the middle of one of these storms. Maybe it's a financial storm brought on by a collapsing economy, or, or it might be a physical storm caused by a chronic health condition. Your storm might be a sick loved one or, or your storm might be, uh, you know, your struggles as a single parent or, or some of us are facing the mental storms of depression. Others are in the middle of a marital storm that's resulting in separation. And the chances are all of us have been crying out to the Lord who seems to be asleep. We cry out to the Lord, and, and, when, and when there's no immediate answer, we, thinking, we think, you know, is he sleeping? Does he even care that we're suffering? I wonder how many of us this morning have been tempted to recently wonder, does Christ even care for me? This is precisely the question that the disciples are posing there in verse 38, where they declare, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing that word care was translated from a Greek word which speaks of the concern that causes a person to promote and protect the well-being of another. When we care for someone else, we promote and protect their well-being. While I realize that there are times when we feel like the Lord doesn't care for us, that he's not promoting and protecting our well-being, I want to assure you that these feelings are false. Anytime you might think that the Lord doesn't care for you, I'm here to tell you those feelings are false. And in order to prove my point, let's consider something that the Apostle Peter writes here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Look with me there at verse 7. Here Peter declares, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. 
Cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. No matter how we may feel when we're in the middle of the storm, we can believe that the Lord Jesus truly cares for us. And while it's true that there are times when the Lord leads us into the middle of the storm, it's also true that the Lord leads us into the storm because he cares for us. Grasp that for a moment. There are times when he leads us into the storm because he cares for us. And the reason why is due to the fact that the storms of life are absolutely necessary for our spiritual growth. It's the testing of our faith that results in the maturity of those who are walking by faith with Jesus Christ. Think about it. What does it mean to walk by faith with Jesus Christ if there's no testing of the faith itself? This is precisely the point that James is making here in the first chapter of his epistle. If you would look with me there at James chapter 1, beginning at verse 2. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in what? In faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Christian, listen, the trials of life that we experience, you know, as the Lord leads us into the midst of the storm, those trials that we experience there in the storm are are actually beneficial for the believer who will seek the wisdom of the Lord by faith in Jesus Christ. If we would seek his wisdom there in the midst of the storm, then he will provide us with godly guidance. He will give us the wisdom we need so that we can understand the Lord's purpose for the storm that he's allowing. And it's for this reason that the Lord challenged those disciples And the reason why is because they were fearfully focused on the storm rather than placing their faith in the Lord. As a matter of fact, it's here in Matthew chapter 8. Here we find Matthew. He's sharing his account of the same storm. And it's there beginning at verse 23 where Matthew writes, Now, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? You know, the Lord Jesus, he's challenging his disciples. There is this boat is sinking. (laughs) This this boat is taking on water, they're they're beginning to sink, and he's saying, why don't you have enough faith here? Rather than focusing their faith on the fact that the Lord was right there with them and therefore there's nothing to fear, they were instead filled with fear as they focused their attention on the storm which was sinking their ship. And it's in similar fashion that there are many believers in the church today who are filled with fear, and the reason why is because they are focused on the storm. As a result, they fail to receive the wisdom that they need to make the most out of the trial that we find ourselves in. Christian, listen, the Lord not only leads us to the storm, but he's also promised to guide us through the storm. And with that being the case, I encourage every Christian to realize that the godly guidance of the Lord, it's really only beneficial to those who continue to follow the leading of the Lord by faith. Therefore, rather than becoming those believers who are being driven by the storm, let's instead spend our time prayerfully seeking the divine wisdom of the Lord. And in this way, those who seek the Lord in the midst of the storm will receive the guidance that we need according to the wisdom of God. Now, in order to further grasp the way in which the Lord wants to lead us through the storm, I want to consider the way that the Lord Jesus encouraged his disciples to to understand that those who walk by faith can actually rise above the storm. With this as the focus... Hold your place here in the Gospel of Mark. Let's turn in our Bibles now to the Gospel of Matthew. I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. 
You see, it's here in the 14th chapter of Matthew's gospel account where we find the Lord Jesus. He's sending his disciples into another storm. And it was there in this storm where the Lord Jesus guided them through the storm so that they might learn how to walk by faith. Let's consider the account that's found here in Matthew chapter 14. If you would look with me there at verse 22. Here Matthew writes immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now, here in these verses, we find the disciples, they're stuck in another storm. Uh, you know, they're out on the Sea of Galilee. And, and, and just, as, just as the story that we're in today, the, you know, the Lord Jesus put them in the boat and sent them out on their way. So they're stuck in this storm. And while it's true that the Lord led them into this storm as well, it's also true that he showed up and he came to guide them through the storm. Now, if you'll allow me a little liberty to spiritualize the story, it seems to me here that the Lord Jesus wanted them to see that those who trust in him can actually rise above the storm. Remember, he wasn't walking in the water. He was walking on the water. Waves were crashing, and I don't know how this all worked out, but somehow Jesus is there walking above the waves. His steps were above the stormy sea. And with that picture in mind, let's consider Peter's response, which is found here in Matthew chapter 14. Look with me there at verse 28. Here we learn that Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Incredible. Peter here is asking the Lord for the power necessary to follow in his footsteps, which happen to be above the water. And as we consider Peter's request, it seems to me that, that he realized that those who will follow in the footsteps of faith, and as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we are then able to rise above the storm. Rather than sitting there in that boat, which was beginning to sink, you know, that rather than sitting there in this boat that's being tossed to and fro by the wind and the waves, Peter instead steps out of the boat and he began to walk on the water. Amazing. He stepped out of the boat and walked above the storm by faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that is until he focused his attention back on the storm. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at Matthew chapter 14. We'll pick up our study at verse 30. Here Matthew writes, When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Here we find Peter, you know, he's quickly sinking down into the stormy waters. We don't know how many steps he took. We don't know how long he walked on the water. But the minute he focused on the storm, he began to sink. He stopped focusing his faith on the Lord, and instead he focused on his fear of the storm that was surrounding him, and he began to sink. And in light of this story, I would encourage every Christian to realize that those who have the faith to follow Jesus can rise above the storm. And as we rise above the storm, we will receive the guidance that we need so that we can just, you know, walk on top of that storm. With that being the case, we should take a moment to ask, Am I currently sinking into the waves of the storm that's surrounding me? Or am I walking by faith as the Lord enables me to rise above the stormy sea? 
In other words, am I allowing my doubts to keep me trapped in the boat as the fear of the storm keeps me from trusting in Jesus? Or am I stepping out of the boat as I trust the Lord to guide my steps? Christian, listen, rather than allowing your fears to keep you from walking by faith, let's instead focus our faith on Jesus so that we can receive the guidance that we need, even in the midst of the storm. So we see that the Lord Jesus he does lead us to the storm. At the same time, the Lord Jesus also guides us through the storm so that we can walk by faith. And as we walk by faith, he will enable us to rise above the storm. And this brings us to our third point, because listen, the Lord Jesus not only leads us to the storm and guides us through the storm, but I want to consider how Jesus saves us from the storm. And with this as the focus, let's make our way back to Mark chapter 4. Here we find Jesus now saving his disciples from this storm. Let's pick up our study of Mark 4. Look, look with me there, beginning at verse 39. Here Mark tells us that Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus saving his disciples from the storm. And as they witnessed the way in which the wind and the water both obeyed his rebuke, they couldn't help but to wonder about his identity. Now, they knew Jesus, but I don't think they fully understood who Jesus was. I don't think it, was, it wasn't until really the death, burial, and then the resurrection of the Lord Jesus that they really began to grasp who this was. And as they see the wind and the waves obeying his command, they're asking, who is this? As we consider their question, it's important to remember that the Lord Jesus isn't just some mere mortal who's powerless to perform miracles. No, instead, Jesus, he is the incarnation of God the Son, and, and therefore he has all authority over his creation. And with that being the case, the disciples of Christ, uh, we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that the wind and the waves obey the incarnation of our creator in order to explain my point, I would remind you of something that the Apostle John wrote in John chapter 1. It's there where he declares, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And notice, all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In other words, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ was there in the beginning of time with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And therefore, all three persons of our triune Godhead, each of them played a role in the creation of the universe. And with that being the case, uh, we shouldn't be surprised uh, by the fact that Jesus has authority over his creation. And as a result, the wind and the waves obey him. What this also means is that those who trust in Jesus have no reason to fear the storm. And listen, this is true, no matter how reasonable it might seem to fear the storm that we find ourselves facing. Think about it. The disciples of Christ had every reason to believe that their life was in danger. Remember, four of them were professional fishermen. They'd been uh, out on boats before. They'd been in the middle of storms before. And so uh, they were able to see that this storm was most certainly cause for concern. At the same time, they were all able to recognize that their lives were in danger because the boat was taking on water. Listen, if you're out in a boat and it's taking on water, that's not a good thing. It's only reasonable to be concerned about a boat that's taking on water and yet the Lord Jesus still challenged them about their failure 
to have faith in him. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at Mark chapter four. I want to begin reading again there at verse 39. Here we learn that Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Listen, Jesus didn't applaud them for their assessment of the storm. Well, Jesus, you know, the storm is really boisterous right now and the water's coming into the boat. We're about to sink and and it's therefore reasonable to be afraid right now. Jesus doesn't approve of that conclusion, no matter how reasonable it seemed to them. Instead, he challenged them because they were leaning on their own understanding rather than trusting in the Lord. They they factored in every equation except for one, that Jesus was there. And so he asked them, how is it that you have no faith? I'm right here with you. Sadly, there are many Christians in the church today who believe that it's okay to lean on our own understanding, especially when all, all the reasons point to a, a certain outcome. There's, there's, if there's good reason for us to fear the storm that we find ourselves facing, then it's okay to be afraid. Because we have this reason and that reason, and you know, if you factor in this thing and that thing, and I can understand this, and, and, and we, when we add it all up, again, fear is the only response. It's most reasonable, Right? With all this being the case and knowing that this is our tendency, we should take a moment to ask, is self-preservation more reasonable than self-sacrificial obedience? Let that question sink in for a moment. Is self-preservation more reasonable than self-sacrificial obedience? With this question in mind, I want to remind you of something that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12. It's beginning at verse 1 where Paul declares, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies safe and sound and free from all concern. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I forgot to focus on the page here. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. According to Paul, the born-again believer hasn't been called to make sure that we're always safe from the storm. The Lord isn't calling us to to live a reasonable life of self-preservation. No one said we've been called to offer ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice because according to Paul, this is the most reasonable path that a Christian can take as we find ourselves facing the storms of life. And you might look at the storm and think it would be unreasonable for us to move forward into that. Well, only if you don't factor in the fact that God might be calling you in that direction. The world around us, they will try to give us all the reasons to disobey Jesus. The world around us will try to press us into its mold so that we look at the leading of the Lord and think, oh no, that's insane. That's gonna take me right into the middle of that storm. That seems highly unreasonable. And while the world is trying to convince us that self-preservation is more reasonable than self-sacrifice, it's crucial for the Christian to remember that we've been called to walk by faith and not by sight. And there will be times when a walk of faith appears to be unreasonable. And yet if the Lord is calling us to it, it's more reasonable to walk by faith with him, even if it results in self-sacrifice. In order to further grasp the point that I'm seeking to make, we should take a moment to remember that those who are walking by faith with Jesus are actually being led by a good shepherd who knows the end from the beginning. The world around us, they're trying to tell us that they know the end. They're trying to tell us that they can, you know, predict the future and tell us exactly what's going to happen. 
but they don't know. If anything that the last two months have shown us is that many scientific models are oftentimes wrong. And yet, how many Christians in the church today are making all of their decisions based on scientific models that keep proving to be wrong? They don't know the end from the beginning, but we have a good shepherd who does. We have a good shepherd who knows the end from the beginning. And with this as the focus, I want to consider the way that David described our Messiah as the good shepherd who knows how to lead us. If you would, let's turn to the 23rd Psalm. And as you make your way uh, to the uh, 23rd chapter of Psalms, I, I just want to take a moment to point out that the sheep who follows the good shepherd is living a life that's more reasonable than the sheep who wanders off on their own because they've somehow reasoned their way to a, di to a different plan. The, the sheep who will just follow the shepherd, even into the valley of the shadow of death, is living a life that's more reasonable than the sheep who decides to do their own thing. And the reason why is due to the fact that the good shepherd is the one who might, yeah, lead us into the storm, but he's also the one who can save us from the storm. Let's consider how King David puts it here in the 23rd Psalm. If you would look with me there at verse one, here uh, David declares, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here in this song of praise, we find David. He's worshiping the one who was able to lead him where? On paths of righteousness. Paths of righteousness. Think about that. And yet David goes on to point out that there are times when the good shepherd, as he leads us on paths of righteousness, takes us where? Through the valley of the shadow of death. Do you realize that there are times when the path of righteousness takes you into harm's way? There are times when the path of righteousness puts your life at risk. And yet we shouldn't be afraid. Why? Because if we're following Jesus by faith, then guess who we're near? Jesus, the one who can actually save us from the storm. There's no reason to fear even in the valley of the shadow of death. And the reason why is because the good shepherd is able to save us from the dark shadow that's cast by the storm clouds that threaten our lives. I'm reminded of the way that the Lord sent rescuers to, to rescue two teenagers who had been swimming off the Florida coast last year during Easter weekend. Tyler Smith and Heather Brown were stranded at sea after being swept away by strong ocean currents. They struggled for an hour as they tried to swim back to the shore and they finally realized that there was no hope for them and they began to cry out to God. Smith told reporters, we linked arms and honestly cried out to God he said, if you're out there, please send something to save us. Within 30 minutes of their prayer, a boat, which bore the name Amen, spotted the teenagers and saved them from drowning. Tell me that's not God. Amen. Without debate, the, the Lord knows how to save those who trust in him. Even when it seems like all hope is gone, even when it seems like we're in the middle of this storm that there's no escape from, the good shepherd is there to guide us through the valley of the shadow of death so that we can come out on the other side a little bit wiser than we were when we entered. This reminds me uh, of something that uh, <clears throat> King David cried out to the Lord. You know, it, this was during the period of time when King Saul was, was trying to kill David. 
and, and David hid in a cave. And it was there in that cave where he cried out to the Lord in prayer. It's the 57th Psalm, verse one, where David declares, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. Here in the beginning of this psalm, we find David, he's asking the Lord to protect him from the murderous rage of King Saul. And it was there in that cave where David realized, you know, that that Saul was probably going to catch him and kill him. Saul had all the resources that he needed to, to find David. Saul had all authority to end David's life. And so David turned to the one who could save him. And as he sat there in that cave, he cried out to the one who could actually help him. And it was there where he realized that those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High God will also abide in the shadow of the Almighty. It's for this reason that, Christian, we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord is a good shepherd. And as a good shepherd, he's able to save his sheep from every storm. With that being the case, it would be completely unreasonable for Christians to fear the storms of this world. The world might try to convince you that that you need to be reasonable here and be afraid of this storm. But the Lord would say, why do you doubt? Is it reasonable to doubt? Is it reasonable to to be afraid of something that the Lord is in control of? Is it reasonable to live in fear of something that our shepherd has complete control over? It doesn't make sense. It's not reasonable. The most reasonable thing that we can do, Christian, is to just completely trust that our good shepherd is in control. It's possible that you've been living in fear of the storms that have surrounded our life. And without a doubt, I mean, within the first six months of this year, there has been one storm after another. And we might look at all of this and think there's reason for fear. And I would say, no, there's not. I encourage you to remember that the Lord Jesus is the one who has led us into this storm. And Jesus leads us to the storm. And the reason why is because he has a perfect plan to purify us and perfect us in the midst of the storm. So rather than being afraid of the storm, let's just say, okay, Lord, Use it to perfect me. Use it to test me and help me to become more like you. At the same time, the Lord Jesus is guiding us through this storm. And and in this way, he's leading us to learn how to walk by faith and not by sight. And with that being the case, we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord Jesus saves us from the storm. And as he guides us through the valley of the shadow of death, we can rejoice in knowing that he's leading us to greener pastures. And in this, we can have perfect peace even today in the storm. With all this being the case, it's my hope that we would simply stop focusing on the storms, that we would stop focusing on our fears of the storm. And isn't that the way it goes? You know, the storm comes along and then we start, you know, fearing the storm. Next thing you know, we're fearing the fear of the storm. We start creating scenarios in our mind that are fearful scenarios. And then now we're focused on these fearful scenarios. And so we're afraid of the fear that causes us to be afraid of the storms. And where does it end? Stop focusing on the storm. And instead, let's focus our faith on the one who can actually save us from the storm. And then as we walk by faith with the one who actually has power over everything, including the storm, our Savior Jesus will give us the supernatural strength that we need so that we can continue to serve the one who has promised to save us from the storm.